99% of the international people who talk to me about this film say the same thing. I didn't know Blackberry was Canadian. So Blackberry, the film, film first or series first? Well, it was made as a film first, but what's interesting about it is that it began literally at the CBC, uh, and they were the first people to option the book, which, uh, if you don't know, it was um, two journalists from the Globe and Mail wrote a book called Losing the Signal, yeah. which was essentially essentially charting all of the facts of the case. And the CBC optioned that, and I think for years, they were trying to develop a limited series for it here, as, I, I don't know what their idea was for it, but like a three or four part limited series. Like with you attached? Or? No. Oh. This is, I, I, I didn't even know this was going on. And then I got asked in concert with the CBC and Rhombus Media if I would come in and write something for it. And then that just spiraled out of control where it went from me and my writing partner, Matt Miller, uh, writing a limited series into realizing, oh, I think that at its core, this could also be a film and because this was during the pandemic, development was really going all over the place. And in Canada, something you, you may even be able to appreciate a bit, um, I, I'm not sure how many filmmakers you know, but there is a real pressure to create American investment in your projects in order to get them to a certain budget level. Because Telefilm is only willing to fund movies up to around 50% of what their budget is. And so there's all these secret little wires on Canadian filmmakers that nobody sees, which is that although it may seem like most Canadian films are Canadian owned and Canadian run, the people who actually call the shots in terms of casting uh, so much creative control are oftentimes American sales agencies who come in and finish the budget. They give you the rest of the money that you need. And there's so many strings attached to that money. And so my strategy as I've, I've started making more and more movies as an adult is to try to limit that influence as much as possible. Hence why we realized, oh, if we make this as a film and a limited series at the same time, we can reduce that American investment to almost zero by working with the CBC and Telefilm. They'll only give you a, a certain amount. And if you want to make something beyond that, you, you have to look outside. And more, It's not if you want to make something beyond it. It's more insidious than that. It's that if you want to make anything, you need to finish your budget. Because what if your budget is uh, like uh, 1 million or 10 million, they're only going to give you 50% of that. Right. And so you have to look to outside So where does the rest of that money come from? Is, oh, is, some, is it going to come from provincial grants? Is it going to come from like the... Can, you the know, that like, we, no. The, no. Those, those, that, that amount of money is never, ever going to come close to covering it. You need to deal with sales companies. And almost all of those sales companies are American. And they're the people who are putting casting restrictions on you, script restrictions on you. They're telling you what, what they want to see in the film. And this, I mean, in some ways, this is like uh, the kind of secret owners of, of so much of uh, the Canadian film industry is that uh, are, are Americans and sales companies. So you're thinking to yourself, um, all right, I have an opportunity now to make this film about Blackberry, yes. which is a Canadian company, very can Canadian story, but also seemingly based on your own like sense of personal freedom as an artist, you're like, how can I keep those sales, art sales agents out of my work? How can I specifically control who I put in this movie? Because I wanted to cast the people that I wanted to cast, yeah. and I was not going to be able to do that if uh, if we had a huge investment from America, which is um, which uh, oddly enough is why the genesis of this limited series into film wound up being so creatively powerful for me as a filmmaker. Yeah, it sounds like it. It sounds it like so you, unbelievable. It sounds like you managed to like circumvent a real awful restriction. Yes, and it was it's a miracle, and I in no small part the success of that film is because we completely controlled it. And had we not, um, well, I mean, I, I, I can't tell what would have happened in that other reality, but, uh, but I see the results of Canadian films where they're, they're at the uh, behest of American sales companies all the time. How is getting all this sort of mainstream attention through Blackberry? The movie came out in May, and uh, I realized after our premiere that my life had completely changed. One of the unfortunate things about... Um, staying in Toronto um, is that I always had a vision of myself as an adult, which was as a, like, somebody who, who really was a prankster and, and, and got to play at the outside, got to be at the margin, right? Who was on your mind? Like, did you have someone in mind? Tom Green. Right. Um, uh, which ironically, centering Tom Green destroyed him 
right? Yeah, yeah. Giving him the the going from the interview talk show, Freddie got fingered, becoming a mainstream. Destroyed him, yeah. right? Yeah. All of a sudden, it, I, I see this happening more and more as I get older. Is that these kind of Andy Kaufman? I saw the same thing kind of happened. Like as soon as you bring these people into the center, right? Sasha Baron Cohen brought into the center. Like you, do, it, you can't. So the, the magic just disappears because you can't see an outsider in the middle the same way. Okay. And I felt like a lot of my identity was going to come from uh, dealing with things on the edges and uh, like experimenting with form, whether that's like comedy or whatever. And and so the relative mainstream success of a movie like Blackberry has... Uh, has put that in major tension for me. And I'm just sort of figuring out how to deal with it. How, how are you doing with it? I'm trying to figure out what my identity is supposed to be uh, now, because it's so <laughs> much easier. It's one of the reasons I wish the film, the Canadian film industry was, was much bigger and that there were still a lot of big players. Like I would love to be like the weird loser that everybody, uh, you know, thinks is odd and pays no attention to because it's a lot easier for me to work that way. Yeah. You, you brought up Nirvana, the band, the show. That's a much easier show for me to make when I have no expectations of myself. Nobody has any expectations of me and I can freely be in the public um, doing whatever I want anonymously. Um, not that that's changed hugely, but it's, it's like the nature of the work. I don't know. We were just, we're shooting a, a Nirvana the Band movie right now. Oh, are you? Yeah. I just, I just got back from New Orleans. We were there for uh, two months and not in New Orleans, but throughout the, the continental United States. And there is a kind of different feeling doing that now and trying to reinvigorate and reignite that, that kind of prankster kid who has no sense of consequences and no sense of gravity at this age, especially after having made this movie that, you know, people are telling me I watched this movie with my parents and I right. loved it. And if I'm, if I'm, if I get this right, the, the, I didn't know you were shooting in Nirvana, the, the band, the movie, but I, what I've heard is that, um, you're doing sort of, you're still sort of doing that guerrilla filmmaking while having sort of awards season screenings of, of at Black the same Theory. time. That's yeah. a weird, that's a weird tension. What, what are those things like? I've never, I mean, I, I feel like you're good at revealing the peering behind the curtain a little bit. I didn't even know these things existed. Neither did I. And I learned about it quite a bit. And the, the idea of, uh, we had uh, uh, two really good friends who had just made an amazing short film about a polar bear, um, uh, Jack and Gabby. I, you might have even seen this. It was shortlisted for an Oscar. It's basically a no dialogue short film that was, I think, instantly bought by maybe National Geographic, I don't know. And it is like an 11 minute short film where you're just watching the life of a polar bear as it gets kidnapped and flown away on a helicopter. But but it's from the point of view of the polar bear. It's a masterpiece. They're making a feature version of it right now with A24. Um, but they went through this the year before and they told me about it and they were like, you have no idea. It's crazy. Like you're meeting all these people and there's so much pomp and circumstance and more than anything, so much money mm. gets spent mm. behind the scenes mm. in this fervor around award seasons. It's unbelievable. It's, it, it's very, um, it, it, it's almost like Oscar Wilde and it's like, it's, it's very much of the high court. These are the sophisticated people. I feel like I'm in a Barry Lyndon film. Uh, sorry, I, I feel like I'm in the film Barry Lyndon. Like it is a, uh, you know, it's like a secret society is what it like really what, feels like. What is it? I mean, so in my mind, you're all in my, in my mind, everyone there is wearing tuxedos and, uh, like, you know, like Victorian era masks. And oh, you think it's like a, uh, what's it called? Eyes wide shut. Yeah. 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 And there's a, you know, and they're, they're drinking martinis and you're standing up and going like, Hey, so this is my film. You guys control the Oscars. Please, yeah. please make, give this, you know, that's how it, I see it. You no, know, weirdly it's, it's much more, um, uh, informal and it is a lot, well, look, every event is different. So, I mean, and I'm such a neophyte that for me to say sure, this I, is what yeah, it is, yeah, yeah, yeah. it is going to make me seem completely and totally ignorant. Um, but it, I'll say from, from my point of view, it has been extremely gratifying to see, um, the interest from such a extremely mixed, from mixed generations around a film like this. But I had no idea this world existed, which is the voting bodies and the critical bodies yeah. of the film industry in North America. It's massive. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole culture. It's like, it's like the fashion world. 
How did you find yourself getting interested in, in this story anyways? Like, I, I understand you, you read the book, and I asked that question intentionally. Like, I understand that you read the book and you have the opportunity to make the film. But, like, even just hearing what I, what I did about you, what about the Blackberry story was, was grabbing you? I'll tell you, at first, I was deeply uninterested in it. So I, I read the book and I thought, okay, this is a, a compelling business story in a way, but I myself... I'm not the person to do this, and I don't know why I was asked. And if you were to ask the people who who uh, wanted me to make the film, I think they'd be like, "Oh, this needs like a kind of new energy or a or a or new take or whatever." Yeah, and but you had this reputation as sort of like a like someone who's going to break barriers. What an iconoclast! Yeah, sure. sure. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so maybe they thought that that would be like a an interesting mixture, but really, I didn't take to it at all. And it wasn't until I. I viewed the story of Research in Motion and specifically those three main guys, Jim Balsilli, Mike Lazaridis, and Doug Fregan, as exactly what it was like for me around the time that you and I met eight years ago, young men who are almost in a kind of fraternal uh, environment dealing with a, a early success. And what that does to the fragmented egos of three very different people who all view work in a different way, which I do. I, I, uh, right before making this film, I, I, I was kind of thinking about like, because I think uh, it, depending on who you ask, I think I come across me personally as very different people. And it was something I was realizing as I was meeting more Nirvana the Band fans in real life. And what I kept experiencing was people who met me and were expecting me to kind of be like crazy or um, kind of zany, like like funny, okay. you know, yeah. like 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 basically high energy, yeah, high energy and irreverent, yeah, like a, almost like a, the cartoon character that they see in the show, very much like the character I play in Blackberry Doug. Yeah. It's like they thought that's what I was, and I was feeling like, oh man, this is so strange that all my friends don't see me this way at all. My family doesn't see me this way at all, but I've created this persona that people think, oh, this guy is just playing himself. And I I found that so, well, I don't know what my conclusions were about it, but I was like, oh, that's interesting. And so I thought, oh, maybe I can investigate this triad in this movie and I can divide these three parts of my psyche into three people because I, like Jim, am very interested in uh, working hard and and going to work in order to accumulate political capital. Yeah, achievement. Right, a- achievement, and even the dark side of that. Yeah, right. Like I'm Ambition. not. A- I'm not afraid to admit that, like, a, like a kind of. Uh, like sharp toothed, almost evil ends justify the means ambition is well within. You got a bit of that. Hugely. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, if you look closely at Nirvana the band or the dirties, yeah. I mean, that's essentially what I'm expressing. Yeah. The, the message of most of those films is, you know, the ends justify the means while also the, but they're all tragedies. Like they all destroy the character. Yeah, yeah, so I'm yeah, acknowledging yeah. don't actually do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But, but, uh, but okay. that's certainly me. And then this perfectionist who is willing to alienate people and destroy his own life in search of something that that he can't even quantify as perfect, just like Mike, that is also me too. But then I'm also the kind of person who's like, let's just party. I don't care. I just want to be with my friends. Yeah. I want to go into work whether I'm being paid or not because I'd rather be here than anywhere else. And I think those three forces or those three psychologies really are at war in myself. And I thought, oh... I can, I can, I can try to work this out in this movie. And so, as soon as I saw that, I really clicked with the material, and I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Is it is it harder when they're real? Oh, this is a great question, and one that I obviously get faced with a lot. Which is, I mean, you're basically walking down the road, sort of towards a, a sense of almost ethics or morality, right? Because one of the things that you never realize when when you're making a movie like this, especially with your friends, is that oh, this is really going to affect people, especially the ones that were showing their lives. Like, I mean, I mean, this movie has affected Jim Balsillie's life. It certainly affected Mike Lazaridis' life, although I, I haven't gotten to speak with him. And, and he's, kind a, of, he's kind of, a, he's kind of out of the, uh, uh, all I've know. heard is that he's extremely reclusive yeah. and that he may be living in Greece. Wow. So I, I, w- I, I wanted so badly to get to kind of some feedback from him. What was that line Norm Macdonald said? The best thing in life to be is rich, but not famous. 
Yeah, well, he's done it. Yeah, it feels, uh, feels uh, all right to me. Yeah. And the other guy is a composite, right? The, the, your character is Well, a... I'm playing a real guy, Doug Fregan, except because there was nothing written about him and I had no videotape right. and really only two photographs, I actually based a lot of my uh, my character on an engineer who I did meet, who is like the 20th or 30th employee. And he was uh, a guy who has amazingly become like one of the world's most famous woodworkers. Yeah, I was reading you talk about His that. His name's Matthias Wandel, and he... He was the person who gave us all the photographic journals that he'd taken of the ni- uh, in the 90s of Research in Motion, and that's what Adam Belanger, my uh, production designer, based everything on. Okay. So I'm really kind of, he was kind of a prankster, like like social convener type guy. I, I, he would deny this, but I'm, a lot of my, my portrayal is based on him. Okay, so you're, 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 you're heading down the road of, maybe we should just play the clip. We have the clip of the of Balsilli on The National being asked about the portrayal in the, in the film. Could we play oh, it? Oh, yeah, great. Well, m- many employees have been very vocal in pointing out to the mischaracterizations, and there's been a, a piece in the National Post today, and I suspect there's more to come. The, the general consensus is it's 5% accurate and 95% made up. And you do have to remember that uh, I've lived 60 years with the word silly in my last name, so I can handle being teased. What do you make? It's funny. I got to meet Jim right after our our Toronto premiere. I I talked to Glenn, who plays him, two hours before the Toronto premiere. Really? Yeah. Two hours before the Toronto premiere, he was sitting right there. Oh, come on. And I said, how are you feeling about it? I think he was a bit nervous yeah, about meeting you were real saying it. Yeah, he was oh, nervous. hugely, yeah, yeah, hugely. Yeah. And and I, look, I know that, be, and that was really started to develop as the as we realized the film was going to get a wide release. Um, but I mean, that just speaks to Glenn's uh, uh, sophisticated empathy. Like he really doesn't want uh, to to upset the person that he worked so hard to portray. But I got to tell you, I I think that at a certain level, Jim is. <sighs> <laughs> he's saying, oh, yeah, 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 they got all this wrong, hiding a huge smile. Like, in many ways, he is, he comes off as, like, the coolest, most interesting guy in this movie. And, sure, he's aggressive and, and I mean, you might even say it sometimes that he's sort of a prick the way that we portray him. But he gets things done. I, I, I say, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. Okay. The, my friends who... Uh, I alluded to this earlier. Almost everybody who I meet uh, and has only, has only seen Blackberry, and they talk to me for two minutes, they're like, oh my God, you are exactly like the guy you play in the movie. And I'm like, yeah, I hear that a lot. All the people who've known me my whole life who see this movie, and I haven't seen me in a while, and I see, they go, oh my God, you're exactly like Jim. <laughs> <laughs> so I- uh, The shadow self, the, the you know, deep, deep down within, the un- unbridled ambition. You want to look, that was my goal. I was trying to deal with this. Um, but but I, I, I couldn't be more thankful with how Jim has, uh, has uh, reacted. Even, even yeah. that is, look, this is, when we were making the film, we were making it under cover of night, letting, not letting anybody know we were making it under a code name because we thought they were going to get an injunction and sue us. Wow. So the fact that the film is out and Jim is talking about it on the national is like- And showing up to the premiere? It's, uh, it, it's like we won the lottery, right? And, uh, and again, he, uh, he and, and a lot of his friends, because he's extremely well-liked in the business community in Canada, obviously, I mean, he's a titan of industry. Mm-hmm. I think everybody is is- either celebrating overtly or secretly over the idea that there's now a kind of renaissance of this period in Canadian business history and that it's not going to be forgotten. Because at a certain level, I mean, I can speak to this directly, 99% of the international people who talk to me about this film say the same thing. I didn't know Blackberry was Canadian. What does that mean? What it means is that we have no like international legacy of great like it's almost like this didn't happen on the world stage. Our country doesn't get the credit yeah. for the fact that we invented the smartphone, and hopefully, this does something towards changing that. Yeah. What's the line? What's the line in the film about creating the getting creating the best team? It's, yeah, it's right. It's in the trailer. It's uh, it's it's when Jim is when Mike is saying we can't do this. Our engineers aren't good enough. And and Jim says, I thought you said these were the best engineers in the world. And he said, Well, I said they're the best engineers in Canada. Do you think about that in terms of Canadian film as well? Oh, absolutely. Oh, my God. It is, it would shock people to realize that English Canadian cinema has... Good distinction, by the way. Major. Yeah, well, major it is distinction. a major distinction. Yeah. Quebec is a different country in terms of its its cultural relevance. Yeah. English Canadian cinema has 
zero international identity. And I don't mean 0.1%. I mean zero. There, nobody outside of Canada cares or knows that we have any kind of cinema of distinction at all. And it's, it's a travesty. It's, it's, it's so funny. I mean, you had made this connection. I'd never even thought of it between basically Blackberry and, and Canadian cinema generally. It does not exist outside of this country. And for, for most Canadians, I think the average Canadian also doesn't exist in this country. I, I don't think, I think if you were to poll just somebody on the street, even in a major city, I don't think they'd even be able to name a Canadian film. So is that on your mind? Like, you, and what I mean by that is that you're not making a film about, oh, I don't know. You're not, you're not making a film about the you know, Henry Ford in Detroit, but you're making it in Canada with Canadian, with Canadian filmmakers, with Canadian behind the scenes folks, with, with, with Canadian actors. You're making a very ultra Canadian film. I was, I was intentional in my introduction to say that this is, this is a very inside Canada film in some ways. There's right. a lot of references. That, you know, this is a very can- Canadian film. How do I put this? Is that on your, is it on your mind to make a really, really Canadian film that's not Canadian? Do you know what I mean? Well, look, you, you, you say not Canadian, and I think that that in well, some ways is a... Is not a, Canadian given what you just told me. Right. Because in some ways, people will use Canadian as a, a marker of a, like almost indistinction, you know, like, oh, oh, it's so Canadian. In fact, in some ways, it's a sort of inside joke that if you say something looks really Canadian, it almost seems like an ersatz American, it, like there's something slightly wrong yeah, with it, right? Yeah. There's an uncanny valley to it, which is normally what, what Canadian means when you're when you're referring to to cinema um especially but, in the states especially when, when they when when you, you, especially in the u.s when you say oh it's a small canadian film well it just it has an it has aesthetic properties yeah to say something is canadian and they're not positive they're all negative right, right? It, it, i mean maybe you could say it uses a lot of natural light that's that's that's, <laughs> that's one thing okay, that marks canadian so film. you're thinking like i gotta make a film about canada that doesn't feel to use the slur canadian you well, i'm not even thinking that i think i'm gonna make one of my movies yeah and the, and the fact that it's fractally canadian is very very interesting to me, and 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 certainly I like the fact that I was able to cast almost all Canadians that people don't really know are Canadians, right? Like Michael Ironside, Saul Rubinek. Like I yeah, want, I, I didn't want, know Saul Rubinek was Canadian. Right. Well, I yeah. wanted to have a I, I, again to to abuse this word twice, but this kind of fractal relationship within the film where you were having the same experience at the actor level that you were at the product level, which I know sounds so pretentious, but I love the concept of people being like, oh my gosh, I remember that product or actor. Oh, and I didn't know that they were Canadian or it was Canadian, right? Like I wanted that experience to be happening on multiple levels throughout the film, um, which is why there's so many of these amazing character actors that I wanted to kind of bring out and showcase in the movie um, and and have audiences react to them, hopefully the same way that they'd react to uh, to Blackberry itself. Where does that come from, Inya? That thing you just told me about, like I said, you know, you're trying to make a non- Canadian film. You said, no, no, no. I'm just trying to make one of one of my films. You, well, look, I'm Canadian. My dad, when I was a kid, it was so proudly Canadian. He's such a patriot. And uh, he would always say, you know, we live in the best country in the world. We just have a marketing problem. And I am, I guess, in some ways trying to um, uh, be the living spirit of that. And I'm trying to, especially for young filmmakers, which has sort of been like the mission of my, I think, my life. Like my B plot is basically trying to get young people to believe that they can make interesting movies in this country and they don't need to leave. Because I think worse than all of the national problems we have, the funding problems, like our our own insecurity about our identity, worse than all of that is the fact that the major marker of success for any artist, musician, filmmaker, whatever, is to leave. You get out. Exactly. And I think that so long as that remains the the number one goal of every young person uh, who wants to make it, we're never going to be able to cobble together a, a meaningful creative identity in this country because we're going to lose all of our role models, which is the which is the world I grew up in. I couldn't name a Canadian filmmaker that I wanted to be, right? It's why somebody like Tom Green was was so powerful for young people like me because he was like a complete and total outsider and a maniac. And 
you know, he's, I look at him now and I'm embarrassed. He's, he's like Weird Al in but, a way. But there's something, there was something exciting that he was like those, I remember the stuff that I first watched. It was from Ottawa. The Ottawa, you on know Ottawa I mean? Channel 10. It was yeah, crazy. Yeah, and like even crazy. in Newfoundland, we got some of that, like some of it would get played on much music and stuff like that, mm-hmm. you know? And there was something exciting. You're right. There was something that was more exciting to me that it was being done in Ottawa than it was done when he was doing it in LA. Hugely. Yeah. Hugely. Yeah. And, and, and. Outside of that, I really had nobody to look to. And so I hope that at least in the next decade, that changes in a major way. And I mean, it's not going to be, I mean, it's going to be a huge job. It's going to be a huge job. I, I, uh, and, and, and I'm trying my best to try to figure out solutions to it, but I'm not like a policymaker or a politician. I actually have no experience whatsoever in how to retain citizens no. into, a, into a community. But Montreal did it really well with musicians. Um, it, <laughs> I don't know what we do. There seems to be a growing cabal of filmmakers in Toronto. Um, yeah. And, and that's worth celebrating and, and optimistic, but God only knows. I mean, is, is, is there, a, this is a big question, is there a world in which we're going to have to rely on those funding bodies less? Is filmmaking changing? Look, my goal, as, and I've stated this publicly many times, is that our problem is that if, if you look at our country in, in sort of a sports team term, is that we are not spending nearly enough money on rookies and almost our entire budget cap is going to like veteran players who need to retire. We have a risk averse, nice culture. And what that leads to is everybody knowing one another Mm -hmm. and it being very difficult to say no to your friends. Mm -hmm. And I think we're stagnating because of that, because with one tenth or one one hundredth of the amount of money we spend on uh, more experienced filmmakers, we could be financing hundreds of kids to make movies. And if they get their start and do something interesting, they'll stay. Because all of a sudden it's like, I just know when I was making my first film, if I was feeling like, oh my God, and my country wants me to do this, this is crazy. I can't believe my country's allowing me to do this. Like it, it, it just lets them know that they've got a home here. Um, and again, this is maybe like a bit like blue sky thinking, but I think it that- It feels kind of patriotic, to be honest, man. You know? yeah, 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 right. It does. Like, it feels kind of like, you know, it feels like- Yeah, which at a time when it almost seems like patriotism is is uh, is is not in vogue at all. But it, 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 like, I think that there can be a Canadian exceptionalism that comes from the fact that we're lacking a national voice. I always pitch this to film students as an opportunity for them to step into a gap because we're totally undefined in terms of what the world thinks Canadian means. Totally undefined. There's a vague sense that we're nice, right? And and if three or four major voices in filmmaking were to step into that void, it would define their careers, define their careers. I, look, I don't think it's going to be me. I think it's going to be somebody who's like 20 or 19 years old right now who is given an opportunity to do this and does something that we haven't seen before. But, but to your question, is this talking about a... Um, I mean, because it, it seems as though a conservative government is coming in. No, that... no, I'm not. I, it wasn't a question. My question wasn't, is this out of some sort of sense of patriotism? Because that's not, uh. my, that's not my sense of you. My sense of you is freedom. My sense of you is from, your, from looking at your work over the past few years, and especially over the past couple of days getting ready for this, is that you really don't want anyone to tell you how to make or how you can make the art that you make, including, so that include funding bodies, that can include American sales agents, and that can also include, I have to leave my home. I have to go yeah, well, right, and that's kind of almost uh, social uh, uh, rules that are put on you, which, which I still very much feel. Although, you know, don't be so fooled. I, I give the sense that I'm like a total anarchist, but like uh, rules are like the best thing in the world for filmmakers. I love rules. Well, that's, I, I that, love them. That's because you're Mike and Doug and Jim. You're right. Exactly. You're all, you're all three. Uh, yeah. And I can't get rid of any of them. But no, but the, the, I think about this a lot in my own life. It's the tension of those three things that makes you who you are. You can't, if you were one of those things, you'd, you'd, I don't know what would happen to you, but it's the tension of all those things exactly. that leads you to who you are. Well, and that, I mean, you basically summed up what, what that movie Blackberry is about, <laughs> that, that they destroy <laughs> that, one of them. That, and... That, that and a scroll wheel, that's all it's about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you get any Blackberries in the mail or anything? Did you say no, but I have, I have hundreds and thousands of them at my office because we had to buy so many of them off of uh, eBay in order to, because they're gone, it's a dead product. Yeah. And so like, I think we might be the world's largest owner of Blackberries in the world. Um, Matt, I really love the film and I really love talking to you. You too. It's a total pleasure. Yeah, man. Nice, nice to have it. Once every, once every seven years, we'll run into each other. Yeah, exactly. I know. I'm going to have to make a, I got a while then to make my next film. Yeah, you do. (laughs) Thanks for coming in. It was a huge pleasure. Thank you. 